All right, I think we can go ahead here. Um, so mine, hello everyone. <laughs> My name is Autumn Sipis. I am the Marketing and Outreach Coordinator with the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare. On behalf of the coalition, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Hospital Pharmacies and the Climate Crisis. Before we start today, I want to acknowledge with respect the Indigenous peoples and communities whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day and on whose traditional territories our work takes place. Throughout the webinar, please use the chat function for any technical issues you may be experiencing and use the Q&A function for any questions you have regarding the presentation. And we will be answering the questions at the end of our webinar today. We will also be recording this webinar, which will be then sent to all of the registrants and available on our website and YouTube channel at a later time. Now I will hand things off to Miles Sargent, the partnerships lead from Peach Health Ontario. Take it away, Miles. Thank you, Autumn. I'm Miles. I am a family physician from Hamilton. We picked pharmacy as a topic tonight because as time goes on, we're learning more and more about the impact of the supply chain on our healthcare carbon footprint. Supply chain is now thought to be as much as 80% of the footprint and pharmacies make up 20 to 25% of the totals. In addition, some pharmaceuticals like MDIs and anesthetic gases emit greenhouse gases during their use. And then there's the dis disposal of pharmaceuticals which are often toxic to the environment. I think that the greenhouse gas contribution of pharmaceuticals has come as a surprise to most of us and is likely why there are not more pharmacists and pharmacy technicians involved in climate action. But that is about to change. Enter Shaliza Sajwani. Shaliza Sajwani is the current chair of the Ottawa Hospital Environmental Stewardship Committee and identifies as an oncology pharmacist working within both climate change and global health settings. Shaliza completed her master's of pharmacy at Aston University and later completed a PharmD at the University of Toronto and later served as the co-president of Pharmacists Without Borders Canada from 2018 to 2021. Shaliza has also recently completed a certification from Yale University within climate and health and is working within pharmacy with pharmacy colleagues across Canada to create a climate pharmacy network. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Shaliza. Thank you so much, Miles. Um, I just am gonna make sure that I'm off mute. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, thank you so much for this uh, amazing opportunity. And I would like to uh, thank the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare, as well as Peach and Cascades, uh, for, for having me today. Um, my name is Shaliza Sajwani. Um, I got into climate health around um, two years ago. I had always been very passionate about climate change uh, for, for several years. Um, however, I was involved with Pharmacists Without Borders for quite some time. And through my work in global health, I was able to see the impact with regards to climate change and uh, then became more and more involved with regards to climate change in my work capacity. Um, over the last um, few years now, a couple of years, um, we are seeing more and more uh, hospital pharmacy climate change committees uh, come across, uh, across the country. And uh, the Ottawa Hospital is just one of these few uh, committees that have have kind of sprung up. Um, because of this, we are building a climate pharmacy network where hospitals will be able to um, exchange best practices with regards to pharmacy specifically. And we're also um, looking forward to engage our community pharmacy colleagues and, um, and also our industrial pharmacy colleagues as well. Um, within our executive, uh, we are recruiting individuals who are pharmacy technicians as well as those who are involved with both hospital pharmacy and, and industrial pharmacy, and we're looking to recruit more within community pharmacy as well. Um, so for anyone who is um, looking at this, these pictures, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, all of these pictures were all taken within Canada over the last few years. Um, you can see the pictures in British Columbia. 
Uh, in particular, um, you can see the, the town of Lytton that is mentioned here, and the, uh, we all know the effects of the heat dome um, that hit Lytton uh, not so long ago. Um, you can see on the bottom right the picture of the Ottawa, the sorry, uh, my own city of Ottawa, uh, which was affected by severe flooding. And uh, we're certainly seeing um, a higher impact with regards to severe flooding, forest fires, and uh, the impact to um, the Atlantic provinces as well uh, with the re recent hurricane. So I'm, I'm sure I'm, uh, I'm basically preaching to the, to the choir here, but certainly this is something that is receiving more and more public attention. Um, for those of you who are here today, um, I'm just going to provide a very quick overview. Um, as we know, we emit greenhouse gases, they tra trap the sun's heat, and then temperature rises. And with this temperature rise, we have everything from the melting of glaciers um, to natural events that um, occur around the world. And um, we are seeing a very big impact with regards to low-income countries, but it's important to also underline that we're seeing a high impact with regards to um, high income countries as well. So um, this is not just something that is specific to, for example, the flooding in Pakistan or, the, or drought in East Africa. This is something that is affecting all of us. Um, I quickly also wanted to mention that um, many of you will, will know of the IPCC report. Um, the IPCC report released in 2021 basically mentioned that um, we do have a lot of opportunity to work on climate change and um, time is also running out. So we really need to keep this as on a, on a top uh, priority. And I know that because I'm, I'm being hosted by uh, the Canadian Coalition in Green Healthcare, uh, Peach, and I know Cascades has, has sent out a newsletter on this. Um, I'm basically preaching to the choir here, but this is just a, a quick recap. Um, so again, uh, we are not currently on track uh, towards the Paris 1.5 to two degrees limit. However, positive things have started to happen and the political interest is growing. But to uh, be successful, we need to start acting now. We can't wait for decades to act and uh, we need to start acting already in this decade. Um, many of us who are attending today have been acting for some time now, but the critical thing now that we need to think about is how can we continue to work across disciplines? Um, so pharmacy is, is, is one discipline where we are now starting to see um, a slow kind of collaboration across disciplines, across organizations, uh, whether it be between professional organizations and uh, climate advocacy organizations, and then slowly, slowly kind of um, get into the mainstream as well. So a quick overview, um, we know that greenhouse gas emissions contribute to more than a quarter of global deaths from heart attacks, strokes, lung cancer, uh, chronic respiratory diseases as well. We know that malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress are all worsening, and uh, we are going to see many thousands of deaths uh, increasing between uh, 2030 and 2050. And we also know that this is not a future issue. We know that um, 20,000 premature deaths each year are already um, attributable to, to air pollution. And it is really the, the most vulnerable of us, the children, um, elderly, and the pre-existing, those with pre-existing medical conditions. These are the individuals who are the most vulnerable. Um, so as Miles mentions, uh, it is sometimes a surprise for us to find out that prescribed and non-prescribed pharmaceuticals um, represent 25% of the total healthcare emissions. Um, one thing that I like to tell people uh, who are not already aware of healthcare emissions is that the healthcare system contributes more in emissions than the airline industry. And out of that, um, prescribed and non-prescribed pharmaceuticals or medications represent a quarter of all of those healthcare emissions, which is a massive, massive contribution. And so because of that, you can see a, a big role of pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, as well as uh, pharmacy assistants and pharmacy managers within um, this work. And you can see a potential big role as well with regards to um, pharmaceutical manufacturing and, and procurement organizations in general. So um, there are initiatives occurring, of course, across Canada um, within and 
within pharmacy and also outside of pharmacy, um, we all know of um, the Canadian Coalition of Green Health and the excellent work that they're doing. Um, some of us may also know of, of Cascades and Peach who are, who are um, hosting us, Peach is hosting us today as well. Um, and then there's Rx for Climate, which is an, a group of experts uh, who work um, around the world. And we now have Canadian representation within um, these climate pharmacy experts. And we are kind of sharing best practices within other, with other pharmacists in, pharm in uh, Australia, the United Kingdom, and the US. Um, and local example is the example of the Ottawa Hospital Environmental Stewardship Pharmacy Committee, which I will um, talk about today. But I also wanted to mention that there are other uh, environmental stewardship pharmacy committees in other hospitals um, that have sprung up. And we are also building a climate pharmacy network um, across, the, across the country. In addition, at the last COP conference, um, the International Federation of Pharmacists um, actually wrote a letter uh, to, for uh, the, the last COP conference, and they are writing a letter for this new COP conference as well. And they're currently working on their sustainability category um, for the International Federation of Pharmacists. So there's, pretty, there's some pretty exciting work that is um, just kind of on, on its way or just beginning. And for some, in, in some organizations, uh, it's been happening for, for quite some time. But I would say that it, this topic is starting to become more and more mainstream because of um, the bringing in of more and more pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and pharmacy assistants, as well as bringing in um, those professionals and other disciplines as well. Um, as uh, many of you know, uh, climate change exists within mitigation as well as adaptation. Um, so mitigation is basically when you try to reduce the emissions and the adaptation is when we are trying to adapt to the existing climate health hazards. Um, so with regards to specifically looking at health. And we'll talk a little bit about how pharmacists and pharmacy technicians uh, can play a role both in mitigation as well as adaptation and what is happening already. Um, with regards to waste management, this is something that is indirectly, of course, related to, mitig uh, to mitigation and emissions as well. But um, waste management has, is, is a massively critical area specific to the environment. So if we think of climate change as a subsection of the impact of the environment, um, the, the impact of waste and uh, the impact of plastic, for example, is, is huge. Um, we're not gonna be spending so much time talking about that today and more time talking about um, emissions reduction and uh, adaptation. However, I do want to underline the, the importance of, of looking at waste management as well. So within uh, climate mitigation, if we were to look at this from a pharmacy sp perspective only, um, there are four various areas that I thought we could talk about. First is um, sustainable procurement and how do you reduce plastic within this? Um, and in general, how do you make procurement more sustainable such that you also try to reduce your emissions as well. Um, the second is medication use and, and looking at specifically anesthetic gases and inhalers, um, especially what Miles was mentioning earlier. The third is looking at operational processes specifically within pharmacies and trying to reduce plastic from that uh, regard as well, but also in general trying to streamline manufacturing or trying to streamline operational processes. Um, we won't be talking about um, buildings, materials, and energy today. Um, I know that there are other organizations that typically specifically focus on this um, topic, like the Canadian Coalition of Green Healthcare. Um, but specifically for pharmacy-related committees, we have spent less time uh, focusing on, for example, community pharmacy um, building and materials and similar to, to hospital pharmacy uh, building with regards to new campuses. So first, I thought we could talk a little bit about sustainable procurement. Um, I want to preface this by saying that I am a hospital clinical pharmacist. So um, my knowledge of sustainable procurement is a little bit high level, um, but I thought that because we are talking to a very diverse audience today, I thought it would be a good idea to just provide a very high level with regards to uh, sustainable procurement. 
So um, first you can see the mitigation of manufacturing impact. Um, so in 2014, Amgen um, opened a biomanufacturing plant and they incorporated something called um, continuous manufacturing rather than traditional batch manufacturing. So basically continuous means that they are combining multiple separate production stages into one continuous uh, production line. And by doing this, they were able to reduce um, emissions by 69%. Uh, Sanofi also followed in 2019, and these figures are quite impressive, um, and it's interesting to see how are these actually quantified, um, but it is the, the field of um, manufacturing, looking at specifically continuous manufacturing, looks, looks pretty promising. Um, the second is looking at renewable energy. So um, there is a automation and energy giant, Schneider Electric. Um, they were, were ranked the, um, the world's most sustainable corporation in 2019. And they launched something called the Energize program to look at how do you increase uh, pharmaceutical industry access to renewable energy. And um, this is particularly promising because you can actually move away from fossil fuels and you can switch to more uh, greener and renewable energy sources. The third one is cold chain shipping. Um, so this one can potentially involve a lot of um, a, a lot of emissions when you look at how medications are actually transported, especially medications that require um, a, a refrigeration unit, um, or they, they basically re require transport at, at, at cold temperatures. So um, there are a couple of areas here that one can look at. Um, first, one can actually look at how um, medications are, are transported. So are you using green vehicles, for example? And second, um, you can actually invest in, in greener, um, greener fuels, uh, sorry, greener fuels and energy sources for transport vehicles. Um, you can look at how these medications are actually refrigerated and look at the type of energy that is used uh, to, to refrigerate these medications. So again, I would say that this is not an area that I'm, uh, I, I have much experience in because I'm again, a hospital clinical pharmacist and most of my work is within committees, but I just wanted to pay attention to various areas of supply chain management mitigation. The last one I wanted to mention about was packaging and pollution. So again, um, one example is Johnson & Johnson basically cutting the amount of packaging that they use to transport their medications uh, by 60%. And you can see that uh, a publication that came out uh, talking about this um, specifically. And they basically looked at efficient ways to store products in transport vehicles. Um, again, this is just basically a snapshot but there is some potential promise with regards to um, looking at sustainable packaging and, and reusable and recycled, rece uh, recycled packaging, recyclable packaging. Of course, one would need to look at how is this packaging actually recycled and, and what is the process that actually occurs with, within recycling. But my point in bringing this up is just that there is some potential promise here. So um, where did all this information come from and how can we look ahead? Um, first, we can start looking at how do you incorporate sustainability percentages within contracts? So for example, within the NHS, they are a little bit ahead of us. Um, all NHS procurements right now actually include a minimum 10% net zero and social value weighting. What does that mean? That means that pharmaceutical manufacturers actually have to meet certain criteria in order to be able to gain this 10% um, so that they can be competitive when, um, when looking at securing contracts for, for hospitals. Um, so this is not something that we have to my knowledge in Canada right now, um, but this is a potential direction that we can go in. Of course, um, they have mentioned net zero and social value guidance. So uh, this 10% is not just related to environmental sustainability. However, um, this is a potentially promising direction. The issue of course, is that you wanna make sure that you don't get into necessarily greenwashing. So you have to look at what are the specific criteria to ensure that um, a, an organization um, or, or a manufacturing company actually meets 
environmental sustainability standards, for example. And these are examples of, of criteria that, that are included within the NHS. And you can see the emphasis on reduction of plastics and packaging, uh, the optimization of low cost, um, sorry, low and zero carbon uh, vehicles, low or, or zero carbon vehicles. Um, and you can also see the, the third point with regards to a demonstrated reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So all of this is very um, interesting as to how all of this factors into creating the sustainability percentage. Um, I just basically created a screenshot um, of this, but there are, is more, um, there, there are more criteria and there's more criteria included on the NHS website. So if you look at climate mitigation within pharmacy, um, we already talked a little bit about sustainable uh, procurement, and now we can talk a little bit about operations related processes. Um, so in a typical uh, hospital pharmacy, you'll notice that a lot of the operations is run by uh, pharmacy technicians and pharmacy assistants, and they are the ones who really understand the processes with regards to plastic, uh, with regards to what are the operational processes that occur between the physician actually ordering a um, medication via either electronic or paper um, ordering and the medication actually coming to the floor. And there are various processes that occur within operations. Um, clinical pharmacists are often involved in verifying the clinical accuracy of a, of a medication. And sometimes you will have distribution specific pharmacists as well. Uh, but more and more pharmacy technicians and pharmacy assistants are really the ones who are running a large portion of the pharmacy itself. So it's very, very important to involve pharmacy technicians and pharmacy assistants within uh, these processes. So this is an example of um, one particular um, uh, organization that focused on operations related processes. And they were, they basically, um, Fraser Health looked at, an, at a, a review of their centers and of their campuses. And they had a look at uh, specific opportunities for reducing plastic and for reducing waste in general. And you can see here that there's a lot of details here that would likely be known more um, by pharmacy technicians and pharmacy assistants. And then uh, those individuals can work very well with operational pharmacy managers. In smaller centers or in centers where you don't have pharmacy tech check tech implemented, um, you can have distribution pharmacists who can really focus on, on optimizing these, these areas. Um, one particular area to look into is um, to look into a pre and post uh, situation and also have a look at uh, various cost savings. So for example, one thing that the Ottawa Hospital is, is specifically looking at right now within our pharmacy department is looking at our particular operations related uh, processes that we've helped to change. And we're trying to look at how much waste we were able to save within a short period of time, and then come up with a cost saving associated with that as well as a carbon saving associated with that. So this is, uh, so this is some pretty interesting work that can, can occur. Um, with regards to pharmacists, uh, there is a lot of opportunity for pharmacists with regards to mitigation. Um, so here you can see some examples with regards to uh, looking at alternatives to MDI inhalers where clinically appropriate, looking at anesthetic gas reviews, um, and looking at deprescribing. As Miles mentioned, um, there is a big underestimation as to the contribution of um, medications to climate change or medications to emissions. So for example, one MDI inhaler uh, is known to be the equivalent of um, driving a car 300 kilometers. And that's not the transport of that um, MDI inhaler or the, the manufacturing of that inhaler. That's just the use of that inhaler and it's really related to the propellant. Uh, similarly, with regards to anesthetic gases, there's great opportunity with regards to prioritizing certain anesthetic gases over others um, because of the carbon impact of, of certain anesthetic gases. 
within deprescribing, we've seen a big movement to de with regards to deprescribing, de uh, a, a clinical movement related to deprescribing, specifically in um, palliative care and geriatric populations where you have more and more polypharmacy. But there's a new potential opportunity for sustainable prescribing, where we also look at the impact of medications to the environment while also ensuring that we don't compromise uh, patient care. So there's a lot of opportunity uh, for pharmacists um, and clinical pharmacists within these areas. Um, so how, how does this impact happen? And um, how can pharmacists basically work in these areas? So one example is uh, the creation of a climate pharmacy committee. Um, so for us, we have this Ottawa Hospital Environmental Stewardship Committee, and we've focused in uh, five different areas, education, research, uh, p and or the minimization of high emission medications, um, operations. Um, we are primarily focused on operations right now, and we will eventually also be looking at supply chain as well as partnerships. Um, and we're not the only environmental pharmacy committee that exists. There are others that have sprung up over the last one or two years. And you can see Island Health, Sunnybrook, Fraser um, Health mentioned here, the Royal Columbian Hospital as well. Um, and there are other hospitals that, as we speak, are thinking of uh, creating their own committee. Um, it's great to be able to have opportunities to share best practices here. Um, and because of that, that's that, that is the reason why we are trying to create our climate pharmacy network in order to share best practices. Um, the article that you see on my right is um, called The Pharmacist's Role in Climate Change, A Call to Action, and it was basically published by my co-chair of the Climate Pharmacy Network and uh, served as a blueprint for our Ottawa Hospital Environmental Stewardship Committee. This is just an example of an education related poster and it was actually published by the sustainable health system community of practice. Um, and I just wanted to show this uh, by saying that, you know, we one doesn't necessarily need to start complete from, completely from scratch. There are organizations that are really willing to partner with us um, in order to be able to um, ensure that we can make a high impact in, sh in a short period of time. And uh, this is an excellent uh, um, image as well that really shows the impact of the, of the uh, MDI inhaler. So um, I also wanted to mention that within research, there's a lot of, um, there's, there's multiple potential avenues here. Um, so pharmacy uh, often does a lot of work with regards to research. We have our own residency programs that need, to, and, and each, of their, uh, each of the pharmacy residents going through the programs need to do a research project. Um, so currently we have a pharmacy resident doing a research project on uh, looking at MDI uh, prescribing and dispensing practices. And we know of at least one other resident at Island Health that's doing something similar. Um, the Ottawa Hospital Pharmacy Environmental Stewardship Committee, the, the research team is also looking into a, a scoping review and they are working with multiple providers for that as well. But these are just examples of, of some research projects that uh, can occur. Um, with regards to the structure of a committee, uh, if anyone was thinking of starting a committee in their own uh, practice setting, um, we created uh, five different teams within our committee. Um, it was very important to include both pharmacists and pharmacy technicians, set objectives uh, for each group and help and, and allow the uh, group to basically um, come use their creativity within uh, thinking about their, their, their strategic direction while also providing some very good support and then helping to help to create some clear um, objectives as well. One thing I want to underline is that all of these pharmacists and pharmacy technicians are doing this at the side of their desk, meaning that they all have full time jobs. So um, our committee actually has 12 individuals um, and each of these individuals are probably putting in one or two hours a week. But you can see that those two hours a week really add up really quickly when you think that there's um, there's 12 people. However, uh, for the future to be able to scale up, it would be really good to think about innovative funding models um, to, to look at the future of these uh, types of committees and climate pharmacy work in general. 
Um, so this is basically an excerpt of what the Ottawa Hospital Environmental Stewardship Committee has done. And again, you can see the five specific areas. Um, what our education group is um, looking is working to uh, provide information about climate change as it pertains to health and health systems, and they have incorporated education um, already within the residency half day program. They are also presenting uh, to the pharmacy department soon as well, and uh, they have some information um, within Circular Waste Month as well uh, within our. Um, what's happening newsletter that is targeting 13,000 people or 13,000 staff. Um, operations, they have, re as I mentioned earlier, the pharmacy technician led area has really uh, worked to eliminate a lot of unnecessary plastic bag uh, wastage and have eliminated daily paper reporting as well. Um, the research team, I already mentioned that are, uh, they are basically working to uh, create research projects within climate and health that are pharmacy specific. Um, partnerships, we are in very good close contact with both Cascades as well as Peach. Um, and we're looking to partner with more and more organizations uh, in order to scale up our, our work as well. And of course, medication use, um, this group has so far completed uh, a great literature review and a proposal to reduce MDI inhaler wastage as well. Um, I wanted to mention again, just to reiterate that all of this takes place with education uh, and, and training, advocacy and partnerships. We need to, and as well as research, um, and we need to move more and more uh, towards the direction of policy and procedure development and think about innovative ways for, um, for financing and uh, the incorporation within strategic frameworks on a, on a high level basis. So um, mitigation talks about the reduction of emissions, but I briefly wanted to mention about adaptation as well. So within adaptation, you have the impact of disaster plan recommendations. Uh, so looking at disaster plans for your pharmacy specifically um, to protect against um, issues with natural disasters, for example. And uh, you also have subject matter impacts as well that, that relate to more therapeutics. And of course, you have the strengthening of supply chains to try to minimize shortages when you have uh, impacts of climate change, such as natural disasters. Um, so with regards to climate adaptation, first, you have a big impact of heat on medications, as well as medication use. So if you think about it, you can think about an individual who has no access to air conditioning, um, who is going through a heat wave and, some, and has all of these medications by his or her bedside, we don't really have enough data to know um, whether those medications would be stable at those temperatures. And of course, we also, um, there's also a big role of um, education with regards to the use of diuretics and ACE inhibitors uh, when you have a patient who has renal impairment and is going through a heat wave. Um, this becomes an even bigger concern when you think about medications that have a, have a really small therapeutic window. So, um, so, patient, so medications where if you dose a little bit too high, you basically get into toxicity. Um, there's also impact of natural disasters on uh, supply chain management. So what is the plan with regards to um, looking at alternatives for medications? Uh, we experienced a lot of this when we were looking at COVID. Um, so this can, th there's a, a, a bit more and more work that is being looked at with regards to supply chain management. Um, this isn't my specific level of expertise, but we have noticed that there, we, we really do need to include inventory pharmacy technicians, for example, within our committee uh, to be able to help look at supply chain management. And of course, um, it's important to also look at um, does the pharmacy specifically have its own disaster plan? And can you ensure that you have good partnership with the hospital's wider um, emergency management team? Um, so first, I'll just briefly talk about subject matter impacts. Um, so we need to remember the impact of climate change on cardiovascular disease because we have higher cardiovascular mortality within heat waves. Um, on oncology because of the impact of air pollution and um, on of, of, of air pollution on lung cancer, UV on skin cancer, um, respiratory illnesses, what's the impact of COPD and asthma, um, infectious diseases. Uh, we know that uh, the spread of malaria changes 
when you have differences in, in water and, and uh, in rainfall and in, um, and in temperature. And we are now seeing incidences of malaria in places where we didn't uh, see them before. Specifically, um, East Africa is a, is a really good example of this. So why am I mentioning this? Um, we, are, we do know that clinical pharmacists, uh, especially within the hospital, often have one a particular specialty. So for example, I am an oncology specialized pharmacist, um, but very few specialist pharmacists will think about climate change with regards to their own specialty. So there's a lot of work that can happen here with regards to the education of uh, clinical pharmacists within specific uh, specialties. And this is a particular area that can be focused on within a committee specific structure as well. Um, with regards to disaster plan recommendations, um, uh, there's not enough time to talk about disaster plans, but I just wanted to highlight one thing in particular. Um, so the ISMP published a great article in August 2022 mentioning that um, we really need to be ready for unanticipated electronic health record uh, downtime. So we, this is this is a massive potential uh, problem where you have an unanticipated electronic health record downtime that could occur for hours and hours at a time. And this could occur for multiple reasons. It could occur because of um, a hacking event uh, that occurred. We, we've seen news of uh, reports that have come out of some small some hospitals in Ontario where hacking related uh, caused a downtime for for more than a day, for example. Um, but it could also happen because of a natural disaster. And in fact, we've seen a um, systematic review that came out of the US that actually discussed the impact of natural disasters um, on uh, cancer centers. And one of the key things that was reported was that uh, you had impact to uh, medication records, whether that was paper medication records or even electronic me medical records as well. So that means that as part of climate adaptation, we need to think about how do you ensure that you have pharmacy, good pharmacy downtime procedures so that we actually know um, what medications need to be made up at what doses when a uh, downtime actually occurs. And uh, just, Quickly, I thought we uh, there's um, uh, some great information within this particular article. If one wants to review this, um, a few items that I thought I would just mention is that one needs to think about the current assessment, uh, look, doing a, a needs analysis, and then also uh, identifying a res response team that includes uh, key pharmacy professionals as well uh, to, to look at um, the impacts of code grays or electronic medical record failures. Um, I just briefly wanted to mention the importance of advocacy and partnership here. Um, so our expert climate is a global alliance of uh, pharmacy experts who have specifically been working in climate change for some time. So um, some of these pharmacists that are on this group have been involved with their own pharmacy, wider pharmacy uh, professional organizations making a statement about climate change. And we are now also starting to see the International Federation of Pharmacists um, making a statement as well about climate change, mentioning that they want to uh, include this as part of um, one of their pillars. So, um, and they are actually drafting, currently drafting a, a report for the, the next COP conference as well. So in conclusion, I thought um, I would just recap by saying that I know we talked about a lot, but uh, first, um, we're all here and we all know that we can still make an impact on climate change and we can make a big impact now that um, can affect uh, so many generations in the future. So whether we are parents or whether we are non-parents, um, if we care about future generations and if we care about um, our young or even our own generations, um, then we really need to be able to take climate change seriously from a healthcare system perspective as well. Um, and pharmacy professionals are actually on the front line of climate change, not only pharmacists, but also uh, pharmacy managers, um, pharmacy technicians, pharmacy assistants, etc. Um, we also know that climate change has a big impact on health 
and pharmacists are on the front line of that. And as well, um, health systems have a big impact on emissions and climate change. And both pharmacists and pharmacy technicians can play a big role in reducing those emissions. So we really need to think about more innovative interdisciplinary approaches uh, on, a, on an urgent basis. Um, of course, we talked a little bit about mitigation and a little bit about adaptation. So we talked about how mitigation can involve a supply chain management review, operations, uh, medication use reviews through looking at uh, anesthetics and inhalers. And we, call, we can also look at sustainable prescribing as a whole while also incorporating concepts of deprescribing. Uh, really your patient with non-small cell lung cancer who uh, is, admitted on in oncology doesn't necessarily need that vitamin D um, if this if if they have advanced disease and their prognosis is short. Um, so this is these are issues that we can really think about and incorporate within mitigation. Um, with regards to adaptation, um, we can think about disaster plan management, um, education through therapeutic impacts as well as uh, the strengthening of supply chain as well. So again, I just wanted to thank um, you all for being here today and thank the hosts of this, uh, of this webinar. And I would like to um, welcome you to ask any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shaliza. That was fantastic. And uh, you know, I admire all the work you've done in the last year. It's pretty incredible what you've done. I think it might even be less than a year since you started that Ottawa group. Um, <clears throat> so brave of you to ask for any questions at all. But uh, so far, there's only one, but I'll keep that in mind for my own uh, questions, okay? So here's the first question. I don't know if you see it there, but um, is there an ideal pharmacy vial for dispensing to outpatients from an environmental perspective? And are there any particular manufacturers? <clears throat> yeah, so unfortunately, to my knowledge, um, there, and it could be because um, from a pharmacy operations perspective, I would probably have to defer to the operations team and, the, and our supply chain management individuals that are on our team. But um, to my knowledge, I haven't necessarily seen environmentally friendly pharmacy vials that in the mainstream. Um, I think there are there is an advent of smaller organizations that are uh, currently looking into these types of initiatives. Um, I know that in the United Kingdom, they might be a little bit ahead of us. So we can, I think, look into this in more detail as to what they are doing and then get back to um, get, get back to us. Excellent. Um... So, uh, David, I don't see your full question there. I just see Shaliza, so maybe that's still being typed. Um, Mike, uh, are there any good LCAs on MDIs that go beyond just the GHG impact from use? So are there any good life cycle analyses on meter dose inhalers uh, that go beyond the impact from the use? Yes. Oh, uh, am I? You're on. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I just hear some echo. Um, okay. That's okay. Um, so to my knowledge, um, most of the work that has looked at MDIs has specifically looked at the impact of the propellant. Um, this is actually a topic that we were discussing today at uh, with my a colleague who is on the medication use um, side of the Ottawa Hospital Environmental Committee. And we had a conversation with Cascades as well. And we were talking about our, about our conversation with Cascades as to what is the impact with regards to um, disposal. So um, let's say if you had an inhaler that was part way uh, depressed and, and not completely used and you were to, to, to dispose this and incinerate this, what would be the, the climate impact of that? Um, and I think we need to see more and more data in this particular area. Um, it's, it's an area that I would say is still, still relatively new because we don't know that if you were to waste uh, this particular inhaler and incinerate it, 
what would happen to, to the remaining um, anesthetic gases that are there. So I know I'm kind of two for two, um, but unfortunately for this particular question, I would say that there's really not enough reliable data that's out there yet for us to conclude um, the, the impact. The only thing I could say at this point is that just the, the use of the propellant itself for us is very alarming. So if, you were to, if we were to think about dry powder alternatives for patients who can actually tolerate um, the dry powder inhaler, then I think that would be a good thing. The only thing is that we can't think of straight up auto subs where we just any any uh, meter dose inhaler would automatically be substituted by dry powder inhaler because of, uh, of course, you have certain populations where they don't have the respiratory capacity to be able to take a dry powder inhaler. So um, really, we need to be looking at populations where um, it either could potentially be used and then consider dry powder inhalers in, in, in these capacities. Thanks, Shaliza. I'll just add, about six months ago, I was fairly intensively looking into LCAs for all drugs, and uh, maybe things have changed, but I found very, very few LCAs on any drugs, let alone um, MDIs. I mean, you can find LCAs on all kinds of things, but the pharmaceutical industry at this point is a bit of a mystery. Yeah. All right. So, Nicole, uh, hi, Shaliza. Wondering if you have any thoughts on the role that social prescribing might play in offering a low carbon alternative to traditional medical prescribing. Uh, can you, um, if Nicole is there on the line, can she elaborate a little bit on her question? Yes. Yeah, so, social prescribing are things like uh, prescribing um, food, healthy diet, prescribing mm. um, exercise, prescribing um, walking in the woods, you know, the park prescription. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we we basically call that, it's we have uh, this, the same, so we basically call that like non-pharmacological, uh, uh, like non-pharmacological treatment. Um, so I, I do, <laughs> I, I think that within cardiovascular disease in particular, within oncology, um, there's a big role to play with regards to the, the role of uh, non-pharmacological treatment. I, I don't think it, it necessarily um, is something that, that replaces um, pharmacological prescribing. However, I think the role of non-pharmacological treatment is severely underestimated. Um, on a personal note, I would say that I'm also a cancer survivor. And um, if we were to think about, for example, the impact of exercise on um, chemo-induced fatigue, on uh, neuropathy, um, on um, uh, even, even white counts, um, there is, there's a big role that, um, that non-pharmacological treatment has. And I think that this role will continue to expand in the future. And I, I, I do feel that it's underestimated. Um, I think we need to become careful though um, to, because there's so much misinformation that's out there as well, that um, I also see individuals on the complete, uh, complete like different side of the spectrum who um, you know, tell me at, at treatment, for example, that they really believe that certain um, certain herbs, for example, that have no evidence next to uh, about, no evidence surrounding it, it, that that's the thing that's going to cure their cancers, et cetera, et cetera. So I I would say that first, with regards to um, exercise and healthy diet, I do feel that their role is underestimated um, by patients and that even with regards to prescribers, sometimes that counseling uh, is sometimes rushed a little bit because um, prescribers often see medications as something more concrete and they will say, tell you, oh, just make sure you exercise um, rather than going through the specific exercise regimen, et cetera. Um, and having said that, I think it's something that's more complementary rather than uh, replacing one with the other. Um, with regards to 
the impact of specific herbs and vitamins. Um, I would kind of put my oncology pharmacist hat on as well by saying that um, one would just need to make sure that it doesn't necessarily interact um, with any chemotherapy as well, um, because there are a lot of interactions with regards to um, how chemotherapy is metabolized. And uh, we see patients all the time on turmeric and ginger and, uh, and garlic and um, and, and all of these uh, herbs can, can actually have interactions with chemo. So um, I, I would advocate for, for, for evidence-based uh, complementary non-pharmacological treatment by, um, evident, by, by providers who are working together and also minimize the amount of, of in, misinformation out there. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. excellent. Uh, next one from Linda, our friend Linda. Where, what, what are the greatest opportunities to reduce climate emissions from pharmacy activities uh, besides anesthetics and inhalers? Yeah. So okay. um, I, I think that the area that all of us have been circling around, but have not, but we need to really move forward in is um, looking at inventory, like a uh, procurement and, um, and manufacturing. I think the NHS is ahead of us um, and the EU in general is ahead of us. Um, but even though we are not, we are clinical pharmacists and, um, and I know my pharmacy technicians will say, well, they, they work within operations. Um, the manufacturing organizations, they, they work with HealthPro and other, other organizations to see what the hospital frontline providers want. Um, and if we can make this a priority to say that, you know, we would prefer to have environmentally sustainable uh, products, then we're more likely to achieve that percentage. Um, unfortunately, this isn't something that we can do on an individual basis. This is something that we need to do while working with each other. And uh, that's the reason why we thought as well that cl the Climate Pharmacy Network would be very important. The, the second area that I think is important to climate change in general that I think most of us have focused a lot on, um, on emissions. Um, and we feel that because we are in a high income country, that we don't need to worry as much about adaptation. And with regards to low income country settings, um, all of my work right now is thinking about, okay, all of my ideas are thinking about, okay, how can these countries, how, how can we think about adaptation? But I think we're underestimating the, the role of that, that adaptation has to take place, um, has to, has to the role that adaptation will take place on a more immediate basis and not as something that's far off in the future. And to think about adaptation is to really acknowledge our, our fears that climate change is not necessarily um, impacting people in the future or people in far off countries, it's impacting us and it's impacting us now. So I would say that one area that I find is of potential really high impact is looking at disaster plans. Um, we had a code gray uh, where, um, and, and I can mention this because this was in the news, um, where we had electronic medical records down at the Ottawa hospital for seven hours. And, um, and now there's more discussion with regards to disaster plans, but um, you know, we, to, to, to be fair, there wasn't really a need to, um, to talk about unplanned downtime for, for long periods of time uh, before. And the learnings of this code grade are gonna help us. But my point is that I think we need to have more partnerships related to emergency management, um, climate pharmacy and pharmacy in general, as well as other providers specifically focusing on adaptation whether that be uh, therapeutics or whether that be looking at disaster plans and especially supply chain. Um, because with supply chain, you don't need to have a disaster affect your facility in order to have a disruption to the supply chain. It can be anywhere. Um, so you, we, we really need to make sure 
that that we can we can look at supply chain in in more detail. Excellent, um, Shaliza. We still have five more questions. Okay, okay. sure. You're doing great. Okay. Um, okay. So David Rosen, here he is. Um, how did you convince your hospital management to accept the need for sustainable practices? Okay, um, so this is a very good, interesting question. Um, and I would say that we were lucky um, because um, our hospital also is a, um, we are an academic teaching hospital uh, associated with the University of Ottawa. And um, the University of Ottawa appointed a director of planetary health, uh, who is a physician, but specifically focused on planetary health. Um, and secondly, um, you'll note that the committee that I spoke about, um, this is a committee that is made up of volunteers. So I just basically presented to the pharmacy management saying that we have all these committees that already exist that are staffed by other volunteers. And if there is enough, if there are individuals who are interested in this, um, can we start up a climate pharmacy committee? Um, and they said, yes. And I mentioned that these would be individuals who would do one to two hours a week. Um, I would mention that I also have a background uh, in serving on volunteer-based organizations through Pharmacists Without Borders Canada. So I, I know how to build, um, my, my specific expertise is to try to build volunteer structures. That, that's, what I, that's what I enjoy. And Miles and I have spoken about this in, in, in a lot of detail. Um, now the second question, and I think the real question that you're asking uh, is funding. Um, because really, we need to think about to scale up in the future, how do you ensure that you can have financed uh, sustainable practices and sustainable practices within pharmacy? And this is a difficult question. Um, there are a few potential options. The first option is to look at um, how do you partner with existing uh, advocacy organizations? So for example, um, Cascades right now has a great partnership with um, an organization, uh, uh, I, I think it's, it's Island Health, and they are currently working on inhibitors. Um, there could be other organizations out there that uh, could prov provide smaller grants and potentially even research grants where one could think of this from a quality improvement standpoint. So if you were to think about um, a project that looked at reducing MDI dispensing uh, reducing MDI wastage, for example, and if we were to look at this as a research project, um, perhaps one could also in the future also look at um, what kind of grants are there right now um, outside of our kind of pharmacy bubble um, that would be willing to, to fund an environmental, um, a, an environmental initiative focused on healthcare. Um, and there's a lot of potential opportunity with regards to research. The third area I would say is uh, related to adaptation. So um, our emergency management colleagues um, sometimes, uh, some, sometimes issues that are right kind of in your face, um, like the, the prospect of having another code gray, for example, uh, can, can attract a lot of attention. Um, so potentially applying for grants that are related to emergency management and related to strengthening emergency resilience uh, could be potentially useful. And then what one could maybe do is look at eventually branding a position as a climate mitigation and adaptation position, such that you have kind of a bi-directional um, approach that focuses on both. Um, the other thing I would mention is um, partnerships with universities. Although this isn't something that we have done specifically ourselves through uh, the Environmental Stewardship Pharmacy Committee, um, I have seen great um, opportunities with regards to global health. 
Global health, especially global health within pharmacy, is another area that's severely underfunded. And um, partnerships with universities have been uh, have been helpful here because you basically uh, encourage pharmacy students to 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 also work on some some fundraising related events, and you're also able to to send pharmacy students on rotations. Um, so there's a lot of potential opportunity here for uh, the involvement of pharmacy students within, um, within potential activities here as well. So long story short, lots of ideas, um, not many that have been implemented yet, but uh, we've been, our committee have been, has been in, in existence for, uh, for 10 months, um, but there's a lot of potential ideas for the future. Okay, um, so it's nine o'clock, and if anybody wants to hop off, uh, we will not take offense. We do have another 15 minutes, Shaliza. Sure. Okay. Um, Ariane Blanc, <laughs> thank you for the great presentation. Have you found specific CKPI to evaluate your pharmacy echo initiatives impact on carbon footprint? Yeah, so um, in regards to KPIs, um, and I'm lucky that um, I have more experience with regards to indicators uh, with my work in other areas, um, we are slowly starting to establish indicators for our committee. Um, with regards to operations, we have asked a pharmacy student to quantify uh, and count how much plastic we were able to save and then we're, we're going to be able to um, roll this out, have a look on a kind of daily basis and then like multiply it by X amount to get it on a monthly basis, et cetera. And then we will try to convert that to carbon. We're also focus going to be focusing on that um, with our residency project, focusing on um, the, the inhaler practices. Um, so the dis dispensing and the prescribing practices we're looking at um, cost related uh, indicators and carbon related indicators and, and the number of inhalers, for example. Um, and we'll be, we'll be able to use this with the functioning uh, to show progress with the functioning of our committee as well. Um, for some areas, sometimes it's difficult to, to use KPIs. Um, so one of the areas that you may have seen was um, partnerships and um, I'm on the partnerships group and my role is basically to represent the Ottawa Hospital Pharmacy Environmental Stewardship Committee to other groups and to find opportunities for working together. And I've done this, which I've tried to do with this with Peach, with Cascades, with, um, with other organizations as well. Um, but sometimes those are a little bit harder to quantify in terms of hard outcomes. You can quantify outputs. Um, but sometimes it's harder to quantify, for example, you, you can't quantify like the amount of carbon saved, for example, or the amount of cost saved with something like this. Um, I meant, I'm glad you mentioned KPIs because I do think that there is op uh, opportunity with regards to um, looking at cost saving. And um, if you were to say that, oh, our committee was able to save X amount of co cost or X, X money um, by implementing these operational initiatives, then one could say, oh, well, we, perhaps we could use that cost saving and invest it in a, in a different area that could actually help us from an environmental stewardship uh, perspective as well. So um, th there's a lot of potential with regards to trying to use our K uh, KPIs to, to track progress and to use them when uh, approaching um, other stakeholders. Great. So three more, here's, a, here's an easy one, Ivy Lamb. How do organizations join the pharmacy network? Ah, okay. So um, if somebody can put my email address, uh, my hospital email address in the chat, um, otherwise I can do that right now as well. Um, I would uh, welcome if you were able to just email me and if you'd like to be uh, in contact, we are actually still in the middle of recruiting. Um, so this is a great time to be involved. Um, we are, um, we've recruited people for education, for mitigation, adaptation, partnerships, and we're looking for some more individuals as well to work within the leadership structure. Um, and uh, those individuals would have to, like the maximum amount of volunteer hours is two hours a week. 
um, we are not asking anyone to put in any more uh, any any more time. Uh, and our goal is that as we can continue to build capacity on a volunteer basis, we would be able to apply later on for uh, for grants that could help fund um, more projects. Okay, great. Your email is now in the chat. Thank you. Uh, Kay Aoki, are there alter or and are there any initiatives to including consideration of environmental issues during pharmacy education? Yeah, so um, really excellent uh, uh, question, actually. Um, so what really needs to happen is that the climate, mitig climate mitigation and climate adaptation has to be considered within accreditation standards um, and in order for this to really um, move quickly. Um, right now it is moving. So um, if I give you some examples, um, I'm presenting at the University of Toronto in December. Uh, the University of British Columbia has reached out to ask for two modules and um, Aston University, which is in the UK, has asked for two modules as well. So two presentations each. Um, however, um, instead of kind of relying on individuals who may or may not uh, choose to, um, to, to include this within already packed curriculum, uh, I think that what we really need to, to focus on as well is um, trying to ensure that we have this as part of the accreditation. And as I, I think that there's a great opportunity here to align and understand um, what are nurse climate nurses and climate physicians doing uh, with regards to accreditation to their bodies. Because um, if we can kind of say that, oh, well, you know, the accreditation process for physicians is underway, um, we can, we have a better case to make uh, for pharmacy as well. However, I, I can say that all of those presentation requests for universities came within the last six months. Um, and I'm sure that I'm not the only one being approached. Um, there must be other universities that are asking other pharmacists as well. So right now we're, we're at, uh, if you think of this as a bell curve, we are, we are, are at the beginning of this curve. But in order to really get at the top, we really need that accreditation. <laughs> Okay, thank you again. And uh, Mike, uh, I, I think I might know the answer to this question, but I'll give it to you. Has the Ottawa Hospital explored anesthetic gas capture and destruction, such as Blue Zone or Class 1, or being successful in reducing dust flooring either with SIVO or going to IV anesthetics? Yeah, so Miles, do you want to answer this or I can take it? Well, my, my understanding is that you are one of the hospitals that has severely reduced the use of desk flooring to less than 5% of volume. Yeah. yeah, so we are, we have reduced anesthetic gases uh, for desk flooring specifically to less than 5%. However, I this had happened earlier. So I don't know if this was specifically an environmental stewardship thing or if this was just kind of a prescribing practice thing. But luckily we have already reduced it to less than 5%. Yeah. We won't take credit for that. <laughs> okay. Okay, Shannon Haggerty. Thank you for all this information. I'm so happy to hear that hospitals and pharmacists are looking at addressing pollution in the planet. I'm a nurse in home care for 30 years and witnessed so much waste, especially PPE during the pandemic, heartbreaking. I needed this to be inspired. Keep up the great work. I will help in whatever way I can. Uh, Shaliza, I'll just say something and then I'll, I'll hand it over to you. I'll, I'll just say that I'm optimistic that we can turn this around. And I think the answer is in the supply chain and how we buy things, both yeah. personally and as a, as a hospital system. Shaliza. Yeah, um, and I also would say that um, there are organizations where um, one can get involved as well. So for example, if you're a nurse, um, the, the, there's a Canadian Association for Nurses in the Environment that is also doing some work. And we, are, we actually, like as a pharm national pharmacist body, we're trying to learn from them. Um, and, and they're doing some excellent work too. So I, I would say that, um, I know it's very corny to say that 
you know, every, every person makes a difference. But if you think about it, um, you know, we are, we are just 10 to 15 pharmacists, like pharmacists and pharmacy technicians in Ottawa. And all we've done is basically now set up a committee. Other hospitals are now learning from us. Um, I wasn't going to mention this, but I, like we presented our, um, our work in a poster at the International Federation of Pharmacists. And now other hospitals in other countries are also learning from us in Western countries are, are also learning from, from us as well. And we have learned from other hospitals. So all of this is becoming a domino effect. And the key thing to do now is not to think that your efforts are too little and to actually become part of, um, of, of key bodies and organizations that are, are working to make a difference. And if you don't see that organization, then to try to create your own capacity within an existing hospital structure. Because um, I, I was not expecting to see many individuals who would be interested in joining the Climate Pharmacy Committee. Um, I just put out a call out in an email to say that if anybody wants to work on climate change work, please contact me. And I got 15 responses within a week. Um, and uh, it, was, it was very inspiring to see. Um, so, there is room in this issue for everyone. And in fact, there is a need uh, for, th there's a need for you. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that this was kind of a, a, a nice and, and potentially motivating presentation as well. Um, yeah, so Shannon uh, works in home care. So the, the other place you may be able to go, Shannon, is the RNAO has an environmental interest group with uh, what I understand might be as many as 2,000 nurses who are part of that. So there are other organizations out there. And Kay, yes, keep up the great work. Thank you. Some thoughts coming to mind, promote prescribing dispensing of just the right amount of medication rather than treat with excessive quantities and help support pharmacies that aren't based on a delivery model? Yeah, so, um, so one thing that we are, so within the hospital pharmacy, you often have um, like a unit dose setting uh, where like specific unit doses are, um, are dispensed to the floor. Um, I think this is where we can also involve our primary care and community pharmacy colleagues as well um, to understand um, what can we think about with regards to uh, quantities in the outpatient basis. Um, and this is why within the Climate Pharmacy Network, we're now looking to basically expand outside of specifically just hospital pharmacy. Um, there's, there's a lot of potential opportunity out there. And I agree. Um, I, I worked in community pharmacy for a year and I saw how much wastage um, was, was just there with people bringing back their medications and there were pills and pills of medications that were just, just being thrown away. So, uh, so I, 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 I definitely agree with you. So uh, that is all our time. Thank you, Autumn, for the intro. Autumn, I think you're still out there somewhere. Thank you so much for your time tonight and your preparation, Shaliza. That was excellent. And thank you, everyone, for coming and participating.